Full credit for this video goes out to this guy, Brendan Bycroft. Now clearly a very talented programmer, but lucky for us, he put together this amazing component-wise 3D visualization of how large language models work. Without further ado, let's explore his guide and LLM visualization. So you might have seen this transformer flowchart before. It's so popular it even makes it onto t-shirts. But now check this out, a full 3D rendering of Nano GPT. But there's also GPT-2 small, GPT XL, and even GPT-3, just to get a sense for the scale of what's happening here. So this is Nano GPT. 85,000 parameters. And we're gonna call each letter a token. So the word token could symbolize entire words, word fragments, but in this case, we're just gonna call each individual letter a token. So as you can see, token A, B, and C are just index one, two, three on an array. In this 3D view, each green cell represents a number being processed and each blue cell equals a weight. Each number in the sequence gets turned into a 48 element vector. And the embedding is then passed through the model going through a series of layers called transformers before reaching the bottom. Now the output is going to be a prediction on the next token in the sequence. So we always talk about LLMs being next token predictors. Well, that's what we've just done here. So at the sixth entry, we get probabilities that in the next token, it's going to be A, B, or C. In this case, the model is pretty sure that it's going to be A, so now we can feed this prediction back into the top of the model and repeat the entire process. Okay, so now let's go into the first component of an LLM, the embeddings. So we saw previously how the tokens are mapped to a sequence of integers using a simple table lookup. Now all we're doing is making it more precise. We're just adding more numbers after the decimal so you can really get in there and tune things. We use the token index, in this case, B equals one, to select the second column of the token embedding matrix on the left. Note that we're using zero-based indexing here, so the first column is indexed at zero, more of a programming thing. That's how stuff looks in Python. You don't start at one, you just start at zero because zero is like nothing. And since we're looking at our token B in the fourth position, so T equals three, it's the zero indexing thing. We'll take the fourth column of the position embedding matrix. This also produces a column vector size C equals 48. Okay, so now take a note that both of these position and the token embeddings were what were actually learned during training. That's indicated by their blue color. If you're wondering like, what are you actually training? In this model, you can see it as the blue thing. And now we have these two column vectors, so we simply add them together to produce another column, which is also of the vector size 48, this one we call C. We run the same process for all of the tokens in the input sequence that has all of the token values and their position in the latent space. Okay, so now the matrix from the previous section is the input to our first transformer block. But the first step is to apply layer normalization to this matrix. So we're gonna normalize the matrix. Each column needs to be normalized. Normalization is an important step in the training of deep neural networks because it helps improve the stability of the model during training. So we can now regard each column separately. So let's focus on the fourth column, T equals three for now. Now the goal is to make the average value in each column equal to zero and the standard deviation equal to one. To do this, we have to find both of these quantities for the column and then subtract the average and divide by the standard deviation. That doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't matter, it's just math, but imagine a bunch of things of different lengths and they're all just squeezed down so that they all kind of fit together the same size. Okay, so the variance in the model is simply the standard deviation squared. And then there's that epsilon term, which is there to prevent any division by zero and breaking the model. We compute and store these values in our aggregation layer since we're applying them to all the values in the column. Now, Finally, once we have the normalized values, we multiply each element in the column by a learned weight and then add a bias value, which results in our normalized value. Now we're gonna run the normalization operation on each column of the input embedding matrix, which we just talked about, and the result will be the normalized input embedding, which is now ready to move on to the next step and be passed into the self-attention layer. Attention is all you need. That's what makes the magic of GPT-4 and Let's look at that now. It is time to talk about self-attention. It's not an exaggeration to say that self-attention layer is the heart of the transformer and all of the GPT magic. It's a phase where the columns in our input embedding matrix talk to one another, basically determine what matters and what doesn't. Because right now everything's like on equal footing. All the columns can be regarded independently. But to do this, the attention layer is made up of several heads. So let's just focus in on one of them so you can get a sense of what it's doing. Now the first step is to produce three vectors for each of the columns from the normalized input embedding matrix. These vectors in this case are Q, K, and V vectors. The query vector, the key vector, and the value vector. Now to produce one of these vectors, we perform a matrix vector multiplication with a bias added. So each of the output cells is some linear combination of the input vectors. For example, 
The Q vector is done with a dot product between the rows Q weighted matrix and the column input matrix. So what they're saying is it's just a special type of multiplication that you apply to matrices so that it's just more complicated, but it gets it done in parallel. So then we're gonna take the dot product operation where we pair each element from the first vector with the corresponding element of the second vector, multiply those together, and then it adds up to a number. And as a reminder, the dot product, also known as the scalar product, is a mathematical operation that takes two vectors, so those big like arrays of numbers, but they have to be of equal length and it combines them into a single number. Okay, now this is a general and simple way of ensuring that each output element can be influenced by all of the elements in the input vector. So where that influence is determined by the weight, hence its frequent appearance in neural networks. Now we're just gonna repeat that operation for each of the output cells, Q, K, and V vectors. And you're probably wondering like, what do we do with these new vectors? Well, here is a hint, key and value which is what you'll hear when Python, where you're like a key value pair. They're reminiscent of the dictionary in software. Then you can query them or just look it up. Like it's a pairing, like this goes with that. So you go find this and then you see what that is. But in this case, instead of just returning what it's connected to, the single entry, we're actually returning some weighted combination of the entries. So that's part of being like, that's important, but like, let's incorporate all the things around it and the things that we've seen before. So that's why you're getting a sense for like, what's more important than what else, but it's very probabilistic. You can think of it more like a distribution. So to find that weighting, so what we should give our attention to, we actually take the dot product between the Q vector and each of the K vectors. Then we normalize that weighting before finally using it to multiply with the corresponding V vector and then adding them all together. So the K and V entries of our lookup table are the six columns in the past and the Q value is the current time. Okay, so we do some more math here, some more dot products, and we end up with the attention matrix. Okay, now for reference, these dot products are a way of measuring how similar, like the similarity between two vectors. So if they're very similar, the dot product will be very large. If they're very different, the dot product will be small or even negative. Whoa, so this is totally new to me, but I guess the idea of only using the query against past keys makes this a causal self-attention. That is that tokens can't see into the future because you only wanted to look at past data to make a prediction, so they're cutting that out. Another element is that after you take the dot product, you also divide by the square root of A, where A is the length of Q, K, and V vectors. That's a scaling mechanism, so you're kind of normalizing it to prevent large values from dominating the normalization. So now finally, we can produce the output vector for our columns, T equals five, and we can look at the T equals five row of the normalized self-attention matrix and for each element, multiply the corresponding V vectors of the other column element wise, just one by one. So let's watch that now. Oh my gosh, look at that. Multiplying them all element wise, one by one. Okay, and then we can add all of these up to produce our output vector. And it's cool because now this output vector will be dominated by V vectors from columns that have high scores. We have something to pay attention to. Now that we know the process, let's run it for all the columns. So that's the process for a single head of the self-attention layer. So the main goal of self-attention is that each column wants to find relevant information from the other columns, extract their values, and it does so by comparing its query vector to the keys of those other columns with the added restriction that it can only look up things in the past. I'm not gonna lie, I'm learning a lot along with you, so hopefully this is making sense. So after the self-attention process, we have outputs from each of the heads. These outputs are the appropriately mixed V vectors influenced by the K and Q vectors. To combine the output vectors from each head, we simply stack them on top of each other. So for time T equaling four, we go from three vectors of length A equals 16 to one vector of length C equals 48. It's worth noting that in GPT, the length of the vector within a head, so where A equals 16, is equal to C divided by the number of heads. This ensures that when we stack them back together, we get the original length of C again. Now from here, we actually perform the projection. What we're gonna get is the output of the layer. Now this is gonna be a simple matrix vector multiplication on a per column basis, like a similar operation to what we did in the first part. Okay, now we have the output of the self-attention layer and instead of passing this output directly into the next phase, 
we first add it element-wise to the input embedding. So this process denoted by the green vertical arrow is called the residual connection or the residual pathway. Like layer normalization, the residual pathway is important for enabling effective learning in deep neural networks. Now with the result of the self-attention in hand, we can pass it into the next section of the transformer, the feedforward network. So the next half of the transformer block after the self-attention is the MLP layer, which means multi-layer perceptrons. I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but here is a simple neural network with two layers. Like with self-attention, we perform a layer normalization, just keep everything nice and compact there and evened out. Now in the multi-layer perceptron, we put each of our C equals 48 length column vectors independently through, and then a linear transformation with a bias added back to a vector of length C. So we first run the matrix vector through multiplication with the bias added, expanding the vector to length four multiplied by C. Note that the output matrix is transposed here. So this is purely for visualization purposes. Next, we'll apply the glu activation function to each of the elements in the vector. This is a key part of any neural network where we introduce some nonlinearity into the specific function used, in this case, glu. I remember learning relu, but I guess it's pretty similar. Looks a lot like the relu function. That's exactly what I just was pointing out. But it has a smooth curve rather than a sharp corner. Okay, got it. Back in my day, I remember learning about sharp corners. Things are changing. It's all about smooth corners now, I guess. We then project the vector back down to length C with another matrix vector multiplication with bias added. Like in the self-attention plus projection section, we actually add the result of the multi-layer perceptron to its input element-wise. Okay, let's see how that looks. All right. We can now repeat the process for all of the columns in the input. And now the MLP is completed. We now have the output of the transformer block, which is ready to be passed in to the next block. Oh my God! Wow! And what is that next block? The transformer. Boom, that's it. Pretty simple, actually. That's a completed transformer block you just saw. So these form the bulk of any GPT model and are repeated a number of times with the output of one block feeding into the next continually in a residual pathway. As is common in deep learning, it's hard to say exactly what each of these layers is doing, but we have some general idea. The earlier layers tend to focus on learning lower level features and patterns. Like if you think about a bunch of photos, there's certain things like the edges, like where things go really drastically from like light to dark, the edges of like a cartoon or of a photo. Then with a lot of photos, you'll see patterns emerge like faces have eyes or zebras have stripes. Or sometimes they're just more general, like shadows are usually cast downwards, starting from the top. Sun and light tend to be above things and that kind of is an overall pattern you're seeing in pretty much every image. Like if you look at some of that weird deep dream stuff where like eyeballs and noses are like looking all super cosmic and kind of hippie-like. And then the later layers are learning to recognize and understand higher level abstractions and relationships. In the context of natural language processing, the lower layers might learn something like grammar or syntax or simple word associations, while the higher layers might capture more complex semantic relationships discourse, structures, and context-dependent meaning. And that's where all the magic starts to happen as these things get bigger and bigger and bigger, they become more and more human-like. They get better meaning. Now to the softmax layer. Okay, so the softmax operation is used as part of the self-attention mechanism as we saw in the previous section, and it will also appear at the very end of the model again. And once again, this is another normalizing step because things are starting to get out of whack and we wanna keep compressing it down into something that is manageable. I'm gonna skip some of the details, but essentially we're making all of the values positive so there's no more negative weights and we do some special mathematics if anything goes like straight up exponential and gets like super super large compared to everything else so let's take a look at the softmax operation in the context of self attention layer and a good intuition is if you're wondering why did they choose the term softmax to describe this normalization process so the hard max version of this which is actually called the argmax is where you simply find the maximum value and set it to one and then it assigns zero to all the other values. So it's just like one, everything else is zero. It's just like very binary. So in contrast, softmax is more detailed, like how we were using floating point numbers before to get more detailed. Softmax is a softer version in terms that due to the exponentials that are involved in softmax, the largest value is emphasized and pushed towards one, but it's more of a spectrum. 
it still maintains a probability distribution over all of the input values. So you get a more nuanced representation that captures not only the most likely option, but also the relative likelihood of other options. Now we finally made it to the end, the very last block called output. Now the output of the final transformer block is passed through a layer normalization. So we're gonna normalize it again. And then we're gonna use what they call a linear transformation, but you can think of it just as multiplication, but done to a matrix. Hence, it's effectively producing a score for each word in the vocabulary for each of our columns. And these scores do have a special name. They're called logits. Now the name logit comes from log odds, the logarithm of the odds of each token. Log is used because the softmax that we apply next does an exponential to convert to odds or probabilities. So to convert these scores to nice probabilities, we then pass them through a softmax operation. Now for each of the columns, we have a probability that the model assigned to each word in the vocabulary. In this particular model, it has effectively learned all of the answers to the question of how to sort these three letters. Fingers crossed, each of these letters or tokens are gonna to be put in alphabetical order. When we're stepping through the model time, we use the last column's probabilities to determine the next token to add to the sequence. So input something, we're getting an output and it's making the prediction of which of those next words for ChatGPT or Gemini or which letter in this case is next. For example, we've supplied six tokens to the model. We'll use the output probabilities of the sixth column. So now if you look at the column's output, you'll see there's a series of probabilities and we actually have to pick one of them to use as the next in the sequence. Now you think, why not just take the most probabilistic one every time, but that's a little too strict. So what we do is we actually sample from the distribution, meaning most of the time we pick the most likely one, but it's actually randomly choosing a token that's weighted by its probability. And that gives it a much more dynamic human-like response. That's why you don't always get the same response every time you ask ChatGPT a question. For example, a token with a probability of 0.9 will be chosen 90% of the time. And then there's a bunch of different options. You can always choose the most strict one, or if you'll see sometimes if you're in the back end of ChatGPT, you have certain settings that you can pull back and forth. Those are what you're changing. You can essentially control the smoothness of the distribution by using a temperature parameter. A higher temperature will make the distribution more uniform and a lower temperature will make it more concentrated on the highest probability tokens. That's why sometimes they think of temperature as creative creativity in an output. So I encourage you guys to play with it. There's a link in the description below. There's nothing quite like this I've ever seen before where you can actually just go in, you can see all the components, you can move around them in three dimensions. This is a great way to get your head around how a large language model works. I have learned a lot. Thank you to Brendan for creating this, putting it up on the internet for anybody to learn from. But if you've had enough 3D and wanna go back to 2D buttons, that subscribe button is right there in front of you. Help me get to 9,000 subscribers. Thanks for watching.